me first. And uh, it was funny because I just went for a quick walk outside and I was expecting like everyone to be out there, you know, the New Year's resolutioners, but there wasn't. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. Maybe a little bit of a late start, um, but really happy uh, to be here. We did this talk last year as well, but it was a little bit different. I called it New Year, New You. And, you know, 2020 certainly has been quite a year. Um, and you know, uh, definitely a lot of challenges, but definitely also lots of silver linings. I really want to kind of focus on, on gratitude um, as we get started for, for this session this morning. Um, and I've been hearing this from a lot from people, you know, that I got the quarantine 15, um, <clears throat> I got the COVID-19, not the virus, but the weight. Um, and, you know, because it's been a tough year in terms of just extra stress and uncertainty, um, being at home more, so more, um, accessibility to, to food literally right there. Um, so we're going to be talking about a lot of different things today. And I just want to kind of put it out there first and foremost, that by no means am I going to be doing justice to the subject of weight management in just this amount of time. This is about roughly a two hour session, give or take. And feel free to take stretch breaks as you need. Um, I don't see anyone's camera on. So we're good to go on that um, angle. But um, you know, it's this is really a very deep topic, and it's simplified a lot um, in in the media, and you know, even just going to the doctor. Because what do people usually expect in terms of weight management? It's like, okay, we'll just eat less and move more, and then you're going to lose the weight. And it doesn't sometimes work that easily. And so I'm going to be kind of touching upon these different facets, and I'm really going to kind of keep this basic. That's why I'm calling this Nutrition 101, because a lot of times we forget the fundamentals. Um, you know, what are the different macronutrients? How do they work in our body? How much do we need? Which ones should we choose more of? Which ones should we choose less of? So I really want to kind of get to the fundamentals so that we have like a firm grounding and then kind of go from there. And I know some of you are here because you're just trying to be healthier. Some of you are here because you actually want to gain weight. Um, and then, you know, some of you here because you want to lose some of those those pounds maybe from, from this past year. Whatever your reasons are that you're here, you know, I welcome you. So let's kind of get started. I kind of want to really quickly here. And by the way, you guys, I just love this slide. I just love looking at the, the pictures here, the, the, you know, fresh, you know, um, fruits and vegetables and, and the salmon. And I just want to kind of remind us, that's what we want to kind of get to, the basics, just like, you know, pure, good food that's just not processed and packaged that can really, you know, offset a lot of different systems in our body. So our agenda for this morning is we're going to start off with our intentions and a positive mindset because it really starts from that. It starts, we want to heal from inside out. So I'm going to get into that in a, in a little bit. And then we're just going to jump into the basics, food 101. What are carbohydrates, proteins, fats? How does our body utilize them? What do we need them from? What are portion sizes? I think a lot of times many of us just don't even realize what the portion sizes are because what we're seeing um, just out, you know, if you go to a restaurant or, you know, just picking food up, you know, grocery store, so on and so forth, we see huge portion sizes and we're so used to them. And that's not the norm. So we'll talk about that. Um, I'm gonna break it down to kind of balanced meal structures. And then we're gonna get into strategies um, for weight loss. So kind of bear with me everyone as we're going through this information. All right, so tips to be successful on your journey. It's not my journey. It's not you know the journey that maybe your, your spouse wants you to be on, it's your journey. And really everyone, I know, as I mentioned earlier, this has been a challenging year and we've experienced and we're still experiencing things. I know a lot of us just really sometimes get overwhelmed with. And I know many of you have been struggling maybe with weight, with your health for years. And maybe you have tried it all. Maybe you're really quote unquote good for a while and then you kind of fall off track and it's frustrating. Maybe you might have family members or friends who you're like, they can eat everything and I can't even look at things without gaining weight. So I know we're all kind of, you know, really gone through a lot, but I want you to put all of that behind you. All right. We're different people, right? Our cells are always overturning. Um, and I want you to put all that behind you and I want you to start afresh. All right. And so first things first is really set your intentions. Why are you doing this? 
it really goes back to you, your own reasons, because this is the biggest thing, like as, as Sister Fadwa mentioned earlier on, I've been a dietitian for over 10 years and I've seen it all. I have heard it all. And one of the biggest things that I find with people is just the motivation issue, right? We're super motivated at certain times of the year, right? This is one of those high motivation points right now in the new year. And then we kind of dip down a little bit. Then we're like super motivated again. It's like up and down, a little roller coaster ride. Um, so that's a really huge situation. But the only person that can motivate you is you, right? I'm here definitely as a coach. I can, you know, give a little pep talk. And by the way, I did share my email earlier and I'm really open with my email. So feel free to email me, contact me at any point. Um, I personally would love to have like a regular weight, weight management or just help like team, you know, that we can kind of log in have a little support group because that's kind of what works best to be honest. Um, so we'll see if, if maybe that's something that, that we can do um, in the future. But going back to, you know, just the fundamentals here is what are your intentions for doing this? And I know many of us here that are joining um, are, are Muslim. And what's really beautiful about our deen is that, you know, our body is a trust, right? It's an amana. We're going to be asked about it. How did we treat it, right? We're meant to have a body, you know, good health so that we can, you know, worship and, and, and serve Allah. So that is really a powerful thing that I think a lot of times, you know, could be really helpful when we kind of veer off track. Also, another really big thing is how do you want to age? Because everything that we're doing right now is going to manifest later. Right. And I know many of us have, have older parents and we're kind of seeing them go through this aging process. Right. Um, so, you know, how do we want to age? Right. That's that's a huge motivator personally for me. Um, so let's set our intentions. All right. Why do we want to do this? And then I want us to be optimistic, positive and open minded. There's going to be stuff that I'm going to talk about that you're probably thinking, why are we even talking about this? Who cares about gratitude or motivation? Like, let's just talk about what to eat. It's really beyond that, everyone. It's really, truly beyond that. I cannot tell you how many patients I've dealt with who do eat amazing. Literally, I've seen food records where I'm like, wow, can I publish this? It's amazing. Um, I have people that, you know, do intense amounts of exercise very regularly, but they have a challenge with their health status because they're dealing with lots of stress, sleep issues, right? Hormones, that's a, that's a huge beast in and of itself. Uh, inflammation, the gut microbiome, right? So there's a lot of other factors that are involved, right? So don't blame yourself, all right? That's another thing I really wanna do is because a lot of times we, um, correlate you know how we're eating and i hear this a lot oh i was really good today i was really bad today but then don't make that a reflection on who you are we're human beings and we are surrounded by so much good things right we're like dealing with this just right now right usually at this time of year all the goodies come out right so i don't want you to equate good and bad with who you are as a person all right. Another thing I really want to emphasize here is do not compare yourself. Do not even compare yourself to your younger self. Do not even compare yourself to who you were um, pre-COVID because we were totally different people, right? And in this age of social media where everything is literally in our faces, we're literally will log on, we'll go on Instagram or um, you know, TikTok or whatever. And you know, people are of course presenting their best foot forward, right? And don't forget all the filters, right? And all those things. So do not compare yourself to other people, right? So with that said, you guys, hopefully I want us to really just go into this, again, being positive. You can do this. And it's okay to veer off track. We're human beings. We'll come right back on track. And I don't want you to overwhelm yourself and do everything. I hear this all the time. Oh, I'm going to become plant-based and I'm going to give up grains and I'm going to, um, you know, exercise every day, three hours and like, you know, totally hardcore stuff. It's not sustainable. Pick a couple of things and start with those and then add on to them once you've become regular in your habits. You, they say what habits form in like 40 days. So then give yourself a 40 day period of time. Okay, I'm gonna kind of implement this habit for 40 days and let me add something else, All right? Because our goal is long-term lifestyle change. This is not a crash diet, everyone. 
So we're looking for the long term. Now, what's really helpful, so again, in this presentation, I'm really going to you know, bring in what I've seen through my years as a dietitian in terms of what actually works. So what really is very helpful, everyone, is actually keeping a journal. And um, the reason being is this is a really good way to track kind of, you know, our thought process, what we're doing, what we hope to do. I know some of you maybe not are like journal people. So you can just keep like, you know, I don't know, a video journal. You can, you know, record things, leave voice notes to yourself. Um, but as but I really actually do recommend a, a physical journal because research shows there's something about pen to paper that's very, very powerful. So keep a journal. And in your journal, one of the first things I recommend writing is, okay, your intentions and then your motivations. Why are you doing this? And really dig deep. Don't be like, okay, I want to be healthy. Yeah, but why? Why do you want to be healthy? I want to be around to see my kids get older. Okay, go with, go deeper. Right. I want to see my grandkids. You know, maybe you didn't grow up having your grandparents around and you want that for your grandchildren or whatever the situation may be. But really dig deep. Why is it that you don't want to get certain of these health conditions? Right. Maybe you had a family member that had diabetes and you would take them to dialysis and that was a very painful process. So really dig deep. And then when you have those days where you're like, forget it. I'm having the dozen donuts. No, I don't really care. You can be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me look at my motivations. And I would actually recommend, you know, uh, writing your top three motivations, frame it, put it someplace near you. So you see this on a regular basis. It's also very helpful to write specific action plans. Like what specific things are you going to be changing? Not like, okay, I'm going to eat healthy. Because what does that even mean? Dig deep. What specific thing are you going to do? I am going to make sure that for lunch and dinner every day, half of my plate is going to be non-starchy vegetables. And I'm going to maybe start off doing this three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. After two weeks, I'm going to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. So you literally have some sort of a plan of action. Mark it on your calendar, right? Set a little alarm to yourself. Today, I'm going to now add in 10 minutes to my walk. So it's really helpful to kind of map this out. Other really helpful notations is gratitude. This is one of the most powerful emotions that can change everything, right? So when, again, you're having that day where you're like, forget it, I just don't care. Flip the switch. Look at things that went right for you that day. If you're like, nothing went right for me today. Everything was just negative. Okay, well, things that bring you joy, right? Again, come back to the basics. You know, I woke up being able to breathe on my own. Right? Because this is one of the most powerful emotions that really we've seen in the research that really helps to decrease inflammation. And inflammation is, again, another beast that really wreaks havoc in our body. So things you're grateful for. And I actually recommend, you know, maybe a couple times a week, write some things that you're grateful for. Um, we've seen in the literature that doing this on a regular basis is not like daily basis is not as powerful because then we start to kind of take it for granted. Um, but like space it out, maybe every Friday or something, I'm going to write all the things that I'm grateful for, things that went right for me this week, things that are going well, um, and really just kind of feel that emotion. Other things that are really good to write down in your journal is progress you're making. Because a lot of times we feel like it's like an all or nothing picture, right? It's like black and white. I have to be totally perfect or else I failed. No, we are just wanting progress. So what are you changing up, right? Maybe you're like, hey, normally I would drink three cans of soda, but now I am drinking one can of soda. That's awesome. Write that down. Because again, when we can, when we have those days, which we inevitably do, we can flip back and look, wow, you know, I'm actually doing well. I'm making changes. Reflections during this process. You know, this is really a big thing. Maybe you'll notice things. Um, I'm in a better mood. Um, you know, I have more energy. Also very powerful, and this is definitely in our theme, is to surround ourselves with like-minded people. You know, people that maybe are trying to be healthy, maybe round up a, a, a group of people that, hey, let's kind of check in with each other, maybe share recipes, encourage each other to, you know, do some exercise, you know, take some self-care time, you know, are we sleeping enough, you know, so surround yourself with like-minded people that want to go on this journey. But again, everyone's journey is their individual journey, but we're here to support each other. Some more tips. Now, a lot of times people get very obsessed with the scale. And you have to remember the scale is a snapshot in time. It's just telling you what you weigh at that moment. So let's suppose last night I had a really salty meal, let's just say, 
All right. So my body's probably retaining some water to deal with the excess sodium. So when I step on the scale, I'm probably going to weigh a little bit more, but that's not really me, right? That's all that sodium and fluid that my body's dealing with. So just take your weight with a grain of salt. And again, do not compare yourself. I, I hear from people all the time, oh, uh, like my weight isn't what it was when I was in high school. But I'm like, how old are you now? I'm sorry, we can't be what we were in high school. You know, we have to remember that as we age, our body, just the body composition shifts, right? We do have more, you know, fat stores and so on and so forth. It's just part of aging. So don't look at those and compare yourself to previous numbers. What instead I always recommend people to do is take your measurements, especially your waist circumference. And this is something I suggest doing on like a monthly basis. So just wake up in the morning, use the restroom, and then on bare skin, take your waist circumference. So your waist is kind of where your belly button is, a little bit below your belly button with a tape measure like resting across your hip bones. So that's really, really powerful. Um, so take your waist circumference, you can do your, your hips, that's the widest part of your body, your chest, um, your neck if you want, you know, head doesn't change, don't worry about your head. Um, but keep track of these different numbers because this is where a lot of times we see the difference. Maybe you have a pair of jeans or an outfit that you're like, you know, you can use as, as, as a guide right? That maybe I wasn't able to get into this previously, but now I can. I know with COVID life, zippers have gone, <laughs> zippers have not been used, right? Um, because maybe we're not wearing, you know, pants that have zippers. We're in comfortable clothing now. So maybe take out those zippered pants and kind of see what's going on. Um, and use that also as, as a gauge. Ideally for women, for waist circumference, we ideally want less than 35 inches, for men less than 40 inches because when we have more than that increases risk of different chronic conditions. Also really good to look at is your lab work. Um, I know right now with COVID life, maybe we don't wanna you know, get seen by the doctor. We don't wanna go in and get lab work. So maybe when this is, is over, but this is really also very powerful. See you know, what's your cholesterol levels, your hemoglobin A1C, which looks at your blood sugars over a period of three months. Um, some doctors are willing even to do inflammation markers, CRP. Um, C-reactive protein, which kind of shows um, inflammation levels. So this is something, you know, good to kind of also keep track of and see how you're doing. Um, blood pressure also very powerful. Taking pictures, before picture, you know, and then an after picture, because a lot of times we see ourselves on a regular basis, but we don't see kind of what's changing. So this is also really powerful. Now, I put this in red because this is so important, a food journal. So we have to realize, and this is what we're really understanding a lot in the, in the realm of nutrition, is that this is very individualized because everyone's body is different. Everyone's gut microbiome is different. So even what we were like when we were younger is different than now. And you probably are realizing that in foods that you're able to eat and maybe you're not able to eat. Um, so keep that in mind right? That I am different. So what worked for someone else may not work for you. And there's a lot of weird stuff out there. I encounter this all the time. Um, you know, just different diets out there because everyone wants the quick fix, right? I want to drop weight now. Okay, that's great. But are you going to be able to maintain that weight loss? And then how is that weight loss going to affect your metabolism? How is that weight loss going to affect your gut microbiome? And the gut microbiome is another area. I did a previous talk on it. I think it is, it is online, but I do want to update that. So I'm probably going to be doing an updated version, inshallah, in, in, in the upcoming months. Um, but that's a huge area that we really have to focus on. And I hear this a lot. You know, we see this a lot with the keto diet, right? The keto diet is one that really focuses a lot on, um, you know, eating lots of healthy fats, right? Or just fats in general. That's nice and everything, but then we see the type of gut microbiome makeup is not that great. So these are the types of things that we have to really be aware of is that, yeah, I can drop the weight now, but what are the repercussions later? How is this going to affect me, this yo-yo dieting? How is this going to affect me when I reach menopause? All right, and that's another intention I have. I want to do a whole session on like menopause because the body's totally going to change at that time. Um, but that's a really big thing where, again, our previous uh, habits are going to manifest later. So we want to do this right. So this is why we want to kind of gather data. And when we're gathering data, everyone, I don't want you to do this with judgment. We're so harsh on ourselves. So I want you to do this judgment free. You're like a scientist observing yourself. So 
it's helpful to keep track. Okay, what did you eat? Again, judgment free. Right? Don't be like, oh, see, I'm such a fatty. I couldn't help myself. And I, no, just put that to the side. What did you eat? What time did you eat? That's also very important. And we'll talk more about why later on. What is your portion size? How much did you have? Now, getting into more important things, how were you feeling before? What were your triggers? We should be eating, honestly, when we're hungry. Not hangry, not hungry, angry, where you're like, oh, I'm just going to eat everything. Not like that, but like hungry. And I'm going to actually talk about what hunger looks like in, in, in a little bit later on. Um, but how were you feeling before? Were you super stressed? Were you upset? You know, what were those triggers? That's a very powerful thing to, to be aware of. Um, and then how are you feeling after? Yeah, I felt really satiated. I felt good. No, I felt really bloated. I was tired. Um, you know, I just uh, had a headache. Because a lot of times how we're physically feeling could be due to food. And you'll start to realize this. Um, I remember last year, and I'm going to be talking about it later on, but, you know, I'm going to present the sugar challenge to, to all of you. But a bunch of us were doing the sugar challenge last year. And I remember I finished it. I did it. And then, you know, I was not eating too much sugar. And then I remember, I think it was around my birthday time, that I kind of had an, like, a little bit too much sugar. And I literally felt like a bus ran over me 10 times. I'm not even kidding. I felt horrible. And I was like, you know what? It's the sugar. That's just like, I'm feeling like garbage. So it's this type of stuff that's very powerful because when you start to notice, wow, when I eat this, I get heartburn. When I eat this, I get really bloated. When I, get th when I eat this, I'm just so fatigued. Then that hopefully will motivate us to not eat those things. Um, also, as I mentioned, what satiates you? Because sometimes we eat meals and we're like, wow, I feel really good. I have energy. I just feel like this is really working for me. It was tasty. It was good. Write that down because that's working for your body. So this is very important data that we're going to be gathering. Also, you know, when you are feeling like cravings, that's another thing. Cravings can be due to um, lack of sleep. Lack of sleep really is a big on uh, inciting cravings. Um, cravings can also be because of foods, especially sugar. The more sugar you eat, the more sugar you crave. So, you know, keep track of your cravings. Also time of the month, right? I know we all have experienced that in some form or another due to our cycles. Um, days when you're like, I just want to eat everything. I just want to eat really something really sweet or whatever it may be. So keep track on a calendar. You know, and I would actually recommend this, you know, have a calendar and like write down, like I'm really tired, I'm craving whatever it is. And you might start to notice patterns. That, wow, every, I don't know, right before my cycle, I, I feel like a lot of you know, sugar cravings or whatever it may be. So you'll start to notice trends. Maybe every month at work, you have like an audit and you get super stressed and you might start noticing, wow, at that time when I had this audit, I get super tired. And so these are really, again, this is important data that you can look at and then start to really kind of evaluate your food choices and your, your habits at that time. And by the way, everyone, um, if you have questions, just kind of write them down. And then at the end, I'll, I'll take all the questions and shall at once. All right. So let's get into it. Let's kind of let's go back to the, the foundations here, because, again, I want us to have a firm grounding in this. So we kind of know what the different food groups are, how they work in our body and, you know, portion sizes and all that good stuff. So we have the macronutrients. So macronutrients are nutrients that we need in large amounts and our body does not make them it relies on us to consume them and it needs all of them we should never eliminate any group and we see this a lot in a lot of you know popular diets they'll like eliminate the carbs the carbs poor guys they, they really get a bad rap you know those are eliminated or you know in some groups you know um they're really harsh on the fats so we need all of them you know, God's given us all of these things that we need to be consuming. Now, of these macronutrients, the carbs, proteins, fat, and water, the most important of these four is actually water. We cannot survive without water. We can survive, you know, a little bit without carbs, proteins, fat, but not without water. So we want to make sure we're consuming sufficient amounts of water, you know, non-caffeinated beverages on, on a daily basis. What you can do, what's really helpful, is you can take your weight, um, and um, 
you know, divided in by two, and that can be how much water in ounces that maybe you can aim for per day. You know, we always hear about, you know, six to eight glasses. And remember, the glasses are not the glasses that we have at home. It's the eight ounce glass. Um, so that's about what, 48 to 64 ounces per day, per day give, or, give or take. And a lot of times, um, thirst gets masked as hunger. So if you're feeling like, oh, I'm hungry, we'll drink something and then see how you feel. And then as we get older, and we might be noticing this actually in our parents, but as um, you know, people move into the more elderly ages, um, they're not really cognizant of their their thirst. So if you have elderly, you know, relatives, you know, make sure that they are staying hydrated. That's that's really a big thing. All right, so let's get into the carbs. So this is one of my big pet peeves. <laughs> so those of you that know me, I really can't handle it when people go off of carbs because carbohydrates truly are our body's preferred source of energy. Our body prefers carbohydrates because carbohydrates break down into glucose. And when people think of carbs, they think of glucose, they think of like sugar. They think of like literally like table sugar, granulated sugar being mixed into the blood. That is not what glucose is. Glucose is a molecule, all right? Our blood cells, our nerve cells, our muscle cells and our brain cells prefer glucose. That's what they'd like to use. It's like if you had a luxury car, you're not going to put unleaded gas in there. You're going to put premium because that's what works best in that vehicle. Same with these cells. Glucose is the ideal source of fuel for them. Yes, our body can you know, put together glucose with amino acids, um, but again, the preference is for us to be consuming this. And one thing I'm going to keep talking about a lot is we really have to kind of go back to how our ancestors ate. What, do, what did human beings as a, as a species eat? Because that's what our body is used to right now. Right? This just internally, that's what the norm has always been until you know, the, the last um, you know, 100 years or so. So what did our ancestors mostly eat? Think about that. First of all, they didn't eat that often because right, there wasn't this overabundance of food. But their staple was carbohydrate, right? depending on which region of the world um, that you come from. And there's a lot of research looking at this, that depending on which regions of the world that you come from, our bodies are maybe used to utilizing those original foods. So for example, if you come from a region of the world where they um, ate a lot of rice, um, your body just genetically can maybe handle rice better than someone who comes from a region in the world where they maybe ate more wheat, right? So really looking at what our ancestors ate um, is very powerful. So going back to what our ancestors ate, they actually ate a lot of carbs, right? Rice, wheat, um, corn, um, beans, Right? That, that was their potatoes. That was their staple. They weren't eating as much meat as we eat now. Right? Think about it. Right? Even like hunters and gatherers, right? So the gatherers are obviously eating more carbs, right? But even the hunters, right? Like, how, like were they eating huge pieces of steak every day? Were they catching so much game all the time? Right? Farmers, maybe they had like, I don't know, a couple of chickens in the back, a couple of cows in the back. They weren't slaughtering that on a daily basis to eat meat, right? So our ancestors did not eat as much um, meat as we're led to believe by some of these like paleo diets and things like that. It, that actually was not the case at all. And even the type of meat that they were eating is so different than the meat that we're consuming now, right? It's, it's totally different. Even in other parts of the world, the meat that we see is so different. I remember last year we were, we were in Spain and I remember we had ordered we found this halal restaurant and we ordered chicken and I was like, well, well, where's the rest of the chicken? Cause like, it was so small because even like for me as a, a dietitian, I'm like, you know, I, I just was like used to such huge pieces of chicken that we see now here. That's not the norm. So going back to carbs, this was our staple. And this is still the staple in many parts of the world. Meat in many parts of the world to this day is like, a flavoring, an embellishment. It's not the main source, if that makes sense, right? But the problem nowadays versus our ancestors or versus other parts of the world is the type of carbohydrates that we're consuming, 
right? We eat a lot of refined carbohydrates that are literally stripped away from, you know, uh, the, the bran and the germ, where, which is actually where a lot of uh, phytochemicals and antioxidants and fibers are, we're missing that. They've been processed and stripped down, right? So when we eat these carbohydrates, they break down a lot quicker in our body. Our blood sugar shoots up, regardless of whether or not we have diabetes, blood sugar is going to shoot up. And then this also can incite a lot of inflammation in the body. So this is what the problem is, is these refined carbs, the white breads, the white pasta, the overdoing of white rice, and all the sugar. Think of all the sugar that's out there and the forms of sugar that's out there. I mean, it's crazy. I've shared this story before um, in the past, but I'm going to share it again because it still boggles my mind. I had two students once in a class, and we were talking about carbs and sugar, and I was giving them the this, this same um, in a talk here, basically. And um, you know, one of them raised her hand and, and, and was telling our, the class, you know, she was saying that she's a, she was a barista at, um, at a coffee place. And she's like, I've literally had customers come in, order some of these like sweet lattes, you know, get the extra, you know, shots of syrup. And then literally she's like, they'll order like cake pops or brownies and they'll have us blend them into the drink. And I was like, my mind was blown. I was like, what? It's already sweet enough. And now they're adding in like a cake pop or a, or, or a brownie. And I thought this was maybe a one-time deal, but then someone else was a barista. They're like, yeah, we've had that too. And so I was like, oh my gosh, you know? So this is the thing you guys is the sugar, the refined carbohydrates are the problem. So those things, yes, get rid of those things. That's fine. But don't get rid of carbohydrates in and of themselves because this is really only the really good source of fiber that we get. We don't get fiber from proteins. We do not get fiber from fats. We get fiber truly from the plant-based um, carbohydrates. This is also a good source of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and antioxidants. And the type of fibers that we find in carbohydrates, in the vegetables, in the fruits, in the grains, this is actually good fodder for our gut microbiome. And there, it's and each of it is important. So. This is why we got to get in, you know, all these different foods. And this is also another thing that we should really try to do. And maybe this can be a resolution for the new year is let's try to get variety. It's very easy to just keep eating the same foods. I get it. It's just very easy with like a, you know, a, a tough schedule and so forth. But we need to try to get in variety, maybe eat the same thing for a week. And then the next thing, next week, eat something different, you know, and I actually do want to do a, a meal planning class and shall keep keep you guys posted on that um, to kind of, you know, break down different systems and templates we can use to, to plan our meals, but really try to get in variety. You know, maybe if you go to the store and you always get, I don't know, red bell pepper, maybe get yellow bell pepper, get orange bell pepper. Don't just keep getting, you know, the white cauliflower, maybe get the purple cauliflower. So like mix it up, really try to diversify as much as you can from just the same old, same old. So what are the carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are actually um, vegetables. So all vegetables are carbohydrate. I starred the non-starchy ones because those actually affect our blood sugars the most. Um, and they're a little bit more higher in, in um, calor caloric value. Doesn't mean that they're bad, but we just kind of group them differently. Fruits, um, they have fructose. Um, so that is, of course, um, uh, considered a sugar and it's in the carbohydrate. Uh, grains starches, um, milk and yogurt also are considered carbohydrate because they have lactose, which is a naturally occurring milk sugar. So we want to focus again on quality and quantity. All right. So do not eliminate carbs because carbs are not bad. So keep telling yourself this, write this in your journal if you need to. Carbs are not bad. They're okay. Because we hear this a lot, right? Oh, you want to lose weight? Oh, cut out all the carbs. And yeah, people do lose weight because they are cutting out those refined carbohydrates as part of the process, right? But they're not realizing how their gut microbiome is being affected. And how what starts to happen is if we don't get sufficient amount of glucose, yes, our body can use fats, Right, and then we see a byproduct called ketones being produced, and too much can be, you know, uh, actually harmful. But then what also happens is if we don't get enough glucose, our body can start to actually break down muscles to get uh, protein, amino acids, to uh, 
kind of formulate glucose. So we don't want that to happen either. We want to maintain our muscle mass as much as possible, especially as we're aging. That is very crucial, which I'll be talking about um, a little bit later. All right, so the non-starchy vegetables. So these are all the vegetables except PCP. So peas, corn, potatoes, besides those, these are all the vegetables. And in a lot of diets I've seen, they're like, they count these vegetables as like carbs. And they're like, oh, as long as you're eating, you know, these non-starchy vegetables, you're getting carbs. They're so low in carbohydrate value. Like one serving is like five grams of carb, which is like a nothing compared to the other carbohydrates in which one serving is about 15 grams of carbs. So this is not even counting as a carb. So I mean, it, I don't even go there in, in terms of that. It's technically a carb, but the way it acts, because it's so low in carbohydrate value and it's so low in calories, high in fiber and water, it really doesn't act the same way. So this is going to be the main group that we really want to fill at least half of our plate. So right away, you get your plate, ideally a nine inch plate, load it up right away, half a plate vegetables, just like right away. I know a lot of us are... Um, you know, South Asian. And you know, when I think of like some of the Pakistani vegetables, you know, dishes, I'm like, I'm not gonna eat half a plate of those, right? They're like spicy and greasy, right? So, you know, we have to kind of make some adjustments um, in, in some of our recipes and the things that we're eating. And I'm not expecting people to eat salad every day. That's super boring. Um, but basically whatever you're eating, can you add in more vegetables, right? Maybe you're eating, I don't know, um, soup. So even canned soup, Right, which actually just have a lot of sodium, so try to find low sodium versions. Um, but even canned soup, maybe you have um, some frozen vegetables in the freezer, just add them into there, right, to dilute that sodium and also to add so those veggies in there, right? So constantly, you know, be obsessed with vegetables. You know, a lot of times people get obsessed with calorie counting and so forth. Ignore all that. Don't obsess over that. Just kind of think about, did I get my non-starchy vegetables? So whatever you like, the more the merrier, variety, you know, load up on this. So the ideal is about um, seven to nine servings a day. And one serving is equivalent to about half a cup cooked or one cup raw. And what I really recommend everyone is, you know, take note of some of these um, serving sizes. And I don't expect you to be right, walking around with a measuring cup and like measuring everything. Do not do that please do not do that. But do it once just to kind of get an idea. This is what half a cup looks like in my plate. All right, I can eyeball it. So you kind of have a general idea. So again, the ideal seven to nine servings, but at least start off with three to five servings a day. And I know this is a tough, a tough group, actually. We might have, you know, childhood trauma that maybe we were, would be stuck on, the, on a table trying to finish our vegetables. Maybe we just don't like how they taste. But we have to really pep talk ourselves because this is one of the most important groups because the benefits that we get from the vegetables is we cannot get from other groups the antioxidant value, the phytochemical value that can literally fight different diseases um, really are, are just uncomparable. So this group, you know, give yourself a pep talk, you know, get your kids involved, give them the pep talk. With children, what I actually always recommend is like getting them involved, maybe do some gardening, have them like, you know, pick certain vegetables, have them make the salad so that they have like ownership. So they're a little bit more apt to like want to at least try them. Um, so that it's, it's a tough group, I know, um, but just give yourself the pep talk that truly this is one of the most powerful groups. Um, the amount, again, of nutrients that we get from this group, we cannot replicate. And it doesn't matter raw or cooked. Every type is, is, is fine. You know, as long as you're not deep frying these vegetables, you know, I don't care how you cook them, just eat them. Um, because some vegetables, they actually, like, for example, tomatoes, we actually find that if you cook them, right, it releases uh, the antioxidant lycopene, which really can be very beneficial in terms of, you know, decreasing rates of, of certain cancers. We've seen that. So um, cooked, raw, doesn't matter, just eat them. All right. Now, one fourth of our plate. So one fourth half of a half of our plate should be these preferred carbs. So this is, I just call it your carbohydrate corner, your carbohydrate quarter, whatever you want to call it. But one fourth of our plate should actually be some form of a carbohydrate. Please do not skip these. So in no particular order, right, um, legumes. So these are beans and lentils. Really 
amazing, amazing carbohydrates that we should be incorporating on a regular basis. In one of my other presentations, I actually showed a slide of foods that we should have like on a daily basis. So this should be actually one of those foods, maybe not daily, but like definitely a few times a week. Um, rich in, 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 in beneficial fiber, um, proteins, right? Um, antioxidants, phytochemicals. And we've seen in studies on those that live longer lives, <clears throat> longevity studies, that those people actually eat more beans and lentils, probably because this is a substitute for meat. So whatever, however you like them, just have them. Maybe you have nice bean soup. Maybe you're eating, you know, lentils, you know, having dal, right? Whatever it is, just try to incorporate them on a, on a regular basis starchy vegetables. So this is the quarter of our plate where this is where we put these starchy vegetables. So peas, corn, and potatoes, and ideally not white potatoes. Really the nutrient value is not that high in the white potatoes versus for example, um, you know, the sweet potatoes or, or the yams. There's even purple potatoes. Um, they're purple inside. And I know they're at some like the Asian marts, um, they have them and those are actually really tasty. So these are actually better than the white potatoes. And right now we're dealing with COVID life um, and we're really concerned about our immunity. And one of the immune, I guess you can say enhancers is vitamin A. And vitamin A, its precursor is beta carotene, which we get from like, for example, sweet potatoes, from carrots, from like orange, yellow, a reddish type of, of food. So, you know, that's really, and sweet potato is actually one of the best forms of getting that beta carotene in there. Um, so do that. But if you're like, look, hey, I want to have, you know, a russet, I want to have Idaho potato. I just like, I want to have some, you know, real bashed potatoes, you know, go for it. You know, once in a while is totally fine. No, no one's saying not to, but the ideal is, is those other type. The purple potatoes actually are rich in resveratrol, which is another very powerful phytochemical. Um, so that's really nice to, to get in. And we also see resveratrol also in, in, in grapes. Now the ancient grains, okay? Because I hear from a lot of people, oh, I'm grain free. Now, if you're allergic, if you're like truly gluten um, intolerant, where literally your body's having a reaction to gluten, which we find in wheat, rye, and barley, then okay, fine. Don't have, you know, gluten. Um, but there are other grains you can still consume. And the reason I'm really big on grains is because I really think of like the prophetic life. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ate barley, right? He ate grains. And I'm really hesitant to not to tell people not to eat things that he ate. So, you know, even just eating grains, like think of it as like a sunnah, um, you know, just as a way to incorporate it in. And grains, again, we see this in, in the literature, the fiber that we're getting from these ancient grains and what we're seeing manifest in the gut microbiome is we don't see from other, um, um, you know, fruits or vegetables. So we can't really get those comparable fibers from those other things. So this is why even more so it's important to try to get those ancient grains. So these are grains that really haven't been changed, you know, over the course of time. Wheat has been changed. So wheat of today is not the wheat that our grandparents ate. So I would, yeah, I'm fine if you don't want to have wheat, even whole wheat, you know, that's fine. Just it's okay to eliminate that stuff. The, the gluten value is higher in, in wheat. People are sensitive to it. So that's fine if you don't you want to eliminate wheat, but don't eliminate these other ancient grains. So for example, amaranth, um, barley, buckwheat, bulgur, einkorn, farro, frike, kamut, which is also Khorasan, you know, wheat, millet, sorghum, spelt, teff, quinoa. And now we are seeing these grains more and more in, in the store. You'll see like, you know, ancient grains, um, you know, that all you literally have to do is, is heat up. And I know, honestly, some of this stuff doesn't taste good. Like I will admit, I don't really like quinoa. It just tastes like bird food to me. That's me. That's my own personal taste. Um, but I kind of pep my talk, pep, uh, talk myself through it. And what's helpful a lot of times is, you know, make it with some sort of a broth, some vegetable broth, some chicken broth, just to bring those flavors in. But really, I honestly do recommend getting, you know, at least a third of a cup, one serving worth of ancient grains, you know, on a regular basis. So you can, and you can have it earlier on in the day, um, you know, if you'd like, um, but don't cut them out is, is, is my big thing. Um, oats also would be considered one of the ancient grains, but we want to do like old fashioned or steel cut oats, not the instant oats where you literally look at it, it's like pulverized powder that cooks in 30 seconds. That's not normal. So we want to kind of keep it, again, we want to keep it non-processed. 
I just got, I finally took out my instant pot the other day out of its box after a month. <laughs> And I made oats. That was the first thing I, I made. And I was like amazed at how quick it was. It was really nice. And so you can just make a batch and just, you know, freeze it of any of these grains and then, you know, have them on a regular basis. Um, oats are really rich in soluble fiber, which is really excellent to help uh, decrease cholesterol. Um, a lot of benefits, again, to, to soluble fiber and the insoluble fiber, which we find in some of the other grains. Because fiber, think of fiber, I keep talking about fiber in terms of our gut microbiome. Um, but fiber, think of it like a, a broom. It's literally like cleaning out our, our insides. So when people always talk about, I want to detox, I want to detox. I'm like, okay, we'll eat well. That's your detox. Like eat non-processed good stuff for, 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 for a detox. Um, also rice, but you want to keep it like brown, black, red, or wild rice. Think of white rice as like a treat, right? Seriously, um, think of it as a treat. Maybe once a week you have some white rice. You know, for some of us, you know, dal, chamal are like a, a, a comfort food. So just think of it, again, as, as a treat. But have the brown, the black, red, wild rice, have those instead. Sprouted grain, um, whole grain, whole wheat, these are okay. But again, if you want to try to reduce your wheat consumption, then these would be things that, again, you would maybe keep um, limited. Um, so serving size, we're aiming for about six servings um, per day. So just to kind of give you an idea, so half a cup of the starchy vegetables, half a cup of legumes, ancient grains, cooked oats, all of these are literally like one serving. A third of a cup of rice or pasta is, is one third one serving, a slice of bread, one corn tortilla, all of these um, are, are one serving. And when we're picking these grain-based foods and starchy foods, ideally we want it again in the non-processed form. So like the loose grain, right? So I'm having like quinoa, not quinoa chips, right? Not quinoa pasta, right? Because those are processed. Again, I'm not saying those are bad and you shouldn't have it. Those are definitely better. Like I would rather you had lentil pasta or, you know, um, bean pasta over white pasta any day. But as we're trying to evolve, the ideal at the end of the day truly is to have as less process as we can get. And again, those are goals, guys. You don't have to do this overnight. You know, I always call them like sunset goals. One day I'll get there. Um, but, um, you know, that's kind of what we want to aim for. All right. Other carbs that we often forget are carbs, are fruits. And fruits really have been vilified a lot. I don't know why. Because fruit, think of it as like, you know, God's dessert to us. It's nature's dessert. And have fruit at every meal. Just call it your dessert. Like just psych yourself out. I'm having dessert, everybody. I'm just eating dessert. Here I am. Here's my fruit. Right? Because again, this is really psych based. <laughs> we're, we're, if we, if we, think it, right? Our thoughts and our behaviors, right? Can really manifest in different forms. So I'm having dessert, right? Have some nice berries. You know, when the weather, you know, when summertime, you have your mango, you have your watermelon, all fruit is fine. There's no bad fruit. Please don't villainize fruit. The problem is with fruit is when we have it in the juice form. So juices are actually not ideal, everyone. That is an influx of, of fructose, of sugar without the fiber. So have the fruit instead. I never recommend juice to anybody. The only person I will recommend juice to is that diabetic who's having low blood sugars. That's it. Other than that, no juice. Now, what about smoothies? Even smoothies, you guys think about all the fruit that we put in there. If it's more green centric. If you have more vegetables, you're doing kale, you're doing um, celery, spinach, whatever. And then like one serving of fruit, then that's fine. But make it more, you know, vegetable centric and try to get things ideally in their whole form. So the serving um, size of fruit is like half a cup of cut up fruit. Um, berries were allowed a little bit more, about three quarters a cup. Uh, a medium sized fruit, which is roughly about the size of a tennis ball. Um, dried fruit, about two tablespoons is one serving. So we're aiming for like roughly three to five servings a day. That's fine. So incorporate it. And again, ideally in its whole form. Um, milk and yogurt are also considered carbohydrates. Um, so if you're going to be having cow's milk, which is fine, um, you know, ideally aim for 1% or non-fat. And I know this is another, and I'm gonna talk about this when I get into saturated fat. So we'll get there because I know some of you are thinking, oh, I heard whole milk is healthier for me because it's not processed. All milk is processed, my friends. Um, so just keep that in, in mind. 
So if you're going to be having the cow's milk, again, 1% or less, if you're having cow-based yogurts, 2% or 0% yogurt, and ideally in its plain form, because they add so much sugar to these yogurts that it's crazy. And I see some of you are actually online from, from the UK. Hi, my UK friends. Um, so if you guys came and looked in our US supermarkets at the yogurt aisle, it's so overwhelming. There's so much random yogurts and flavors that we have. Um, so that stuff, a lot of it's even like dessert. So just try to pick like plain yogurt. You can even make your own yogurts um, and then you can doctor it up, right? You can add your drizzle of honey. You can add your fruit to it, but try to get, uh, buy it basic. And this is what we see in other countries, you know, not all this fluff. Now, Again, different schools of thoughts on cow's milk or not. It goes back to your body. What can your body tolerate, right? Some people are like, I don't, I can't handle cow's milk. That's fine. Then you can do non-dairy milks. Yes, there is some estrogen in cow's milk. So ideally, if you're going to be buying cow's milk, again, this is more for the U.S. people because our milk and dairy is very different from, from Europe. Um, but by organic, grass-fed, all of that stuff. Um, if you're going to be buying the, the cow's milk, you can do non-dairy um, drinks. So you can do soy. I, that's what I actually personally drink. I do drink soy. I do, you know, non-GMO, organic, unsweetened. Um, because we do see in, in the research that if we have like a serving of soy, um, and again, there's no estrogen in soy. People, we have, uh, this just like a misconception out there. There's something called phytoestrogen. It's estrogen-like, but it's not estrogen. Um, and what we've actually seen in the research is when people do have maybe a serving of soy, um, then later on when they hit like perimenopause and menopause, it actually helps decrease the hot flashes and, and some of those changes. Um, you know, so starting, you know, earlier on, you know, we, we actually have seen that. And, you know, uh, um, in terms of like breast cancer and soy, there really isn't a relationship, you know, um, because if there, if if soy did increase breast cancer rates, we would see high rates of breast cancer in Asia, but we don't. So it's like the type of soy, it's the amount of soy. So you know, soy is fine, but again, non-GMO, you know, um, organic always. Almond milk is fine as well. Hemp, cashew, oat. There's so many different milks out there. Now I asked, I, I've starred almond and cashew and oat because the thing with those milks is they don't actually have a lot of protein. Usually we don't turn to um, dairy for like as a significant source of, of protein, but as we're getting older, we do kind of want to look at some of the protein that we're getting. So those milks actually don't really have any proteins, like zero or one um, gram, whereas like soy milk has about eight grams, um, cow's milk has about 10 grams, depending Um so just something in mind, again, it's not, it's not a big deal because we truly just turn to milk, honestly, for the calcium. And you'll be getting that sufficiently from all these other non-dairy milks. So the serving size is about eight ounce uh, cup milk, six ounce yogurt, and we're aiming for about two to three servings, um, ideally per, per day. All right, so carbs to limit or avoid. So this is what we actually need to work on everybody is eliminating these type of carbohydrates, all right? So the enriched flowers, if you look on the label and you see enriched, just put it away. This is a stripped down flour. They remove the outer bran, they remove the inner germ, which, which actually houses all the nutrients. Um, so white bread, white rice, sorry, white, uh, white bread, and even wheat bread. So wheat is still an enriched bread. It's not whole wheat. We want to see whole wheat, whole grain. Wheat is still processed up. So if you're like, yeah, I'm having wheat bread. I'm doing good. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's nice. But you're not getting the whole wheat. Processed grains like white rice, white pasta, those snacky carbs, the chips, the crackers, cookies, cakes, pastries, other desserts, uh, sugar sweetened beverages like juice, soda, energy drinks, and then the added sugars. So again, these are things, you know, we can try to avoid or limit, you know, baby steps, everyone don't get overwhelmed with this, just do what you can. Now, what are those added sugars? So these are sugars that were not naturally found in a product, but they could be quote unquote natural, right? Like honey is pretty natural, right? 
But if they're adding it into a product that it wasn't that wasn't there originally, then that's added sugar, if that makes sense. So granulated sugar, brown sugar, honey, molasses, agave, monk fruit, coconut sugar, maple syrup, evaporated cane juice, all the, there's like literally 70 different forms of quote unquote sugar that is used um, in, in, in ingredients. And um, I am, Michelle, going to be doing a class on food label reading. So stay tuned, you guys. It's going to be happening. Um, we'll give you dates um, soon. Um, but I actually do go over. I actually show you some of the different forms of sugar. There is no good sugar. This is one of the most common questions I get from people. What's a good sugar? None. Nothing. None. Right? I know that sounds harsh, um, but there's no benefit to sugar. It's very addictive and there, there's nothing good about it other than it tastes amazing, but it's, it's, there's no nutrients. There's like nothing that we're getting from it. Um, so this is something that we really have to work on. And also we see added sugars in products in the form of artificial sweeteners like sucralose, um, commonly known as Splenda, saccharin, aspartame, acelfame, potassium. This we see a lot in diet sodas and in like uh, light yogurts and things like that. Stevia, et cetera. There's even sugar alcohols, which are a component of sugar, but they're more slowly absorbed in the body. So anything that has OL at the end, xylitol, maltitol, so on and so forth. Um, sugar alcohols, and they will even list this on packages. If you consume large amounts, it has a very laxative effect because it's not totally processed um, and it's, it hits our, um, our gut and there's a lot of gas and flatulence um, as a result. Um, so, you know, just kind of be aware of that. And even the artificial sweeteners, yes, they're zero calories, they're not absorbed, but the thing is they affect our taste buds. So some of these artificial sweeteners are 250 to 10,000 times sweeter than sugar. Imagine you eat something every day that's 10,000 times sweeter than sugar. What's going to happen to you when you eat fruit? It's just not going to taste good. And this is a big thing that I think a lot of times we don't realize is that fruit was truly our ancestors' dessert, right? That was the sweetest thing they ate. But for us now, it's not that sweet because we're, our, our taste buds are so affected but all the sugar that we keep bombarding ourselves with. Also, there's some research that's showing that some of these artificial sweeteners are really changing the gut microbiome. There's some research looking at potential connections um, to cancer risk. Um, so there's still a lot of research coming out on these artificial sweeteners. I actually don't recommend artificial sweeteners to anyone except diabetics. And for diabetics, you know, I would maybe say to use stevia, but in like limited quantities. So far, stevia, you know, is, is neutral so far. I'm saying so far because things always change, right? Um, so, so far that's okay, but there is no good sugar. Now, of course, Sana wise, honey, I, I, you know, say if you're gonna use some sort of sweetener, then, then use honey, you know, raw local honey is, is always better, but even that use in like small amounts. So the American Heart Association actually recommends we limit added sugars to about 25 grams, which is about 100 calories, which it comes out to about six teaspoons for women. That's added sugar. So I'm not counting fruit. I'm counting sugar that's added to products. So you can take a look at that. So when you pick up products, look at the sugar grams and divide it by four. And that will tell you how many teaspoons you're getting in. That's a game changer. So when we do the label reading class, we'll, we'll actually do that. Um, for men, um, nine teaspoons of sugar um, on average. So this is the group I really want us to be focusing on. And this is why everyone, I'm going to present the sugar challenge. Now, no one's forcing anyone to do this. So don't stress out everyone. But this is something I do recommend. Um, especially, you know, maybe every so often, um, just to kind of, you know, reboot your body. So if anyone's interested, if they need a support group, contact me, because I, inshallah, do attend to, to do this starting Monday. Um, but the sugar challenge, this is 14 days of just temporary restriction. So just look at it like that. I'm just temporarily restricting myself. I'm not big on just like overall restriction because overall restriction doesn't help you guys. It really doesn't. If you're like, I'm never eating dessert again, you're just setting yourself for failure, for failure, excuse me, for failure. So don't 
look at it like a long-term restriction. This is just short term. I'm just resetting my body. I'm resetting my taste buds. So what this basically means is for 14 days, we are not eating any added sugars. That includes honey. That includes agave. Yes, I know they're quote unquote natural, but they're added. So no, no artificial sweeteners, no 100% juice. I do not care that you pick the orange from your tree and you juice it with your hand. It is still excessive sugar. So only thing that's okay during these 14 days is fresh fruit and unsweetened dried fruit. And I remember a group of us did this last year and it was it's, it's really helpful to have a support group um, to kind of keep each other in check. Um, but you know, if you're like, I really need something sweet, I just gotta have something, then maybe have, uh, eat a date, right? Have a, a really sweet orange. That's fine, that's natural, that's all right, go with it. But if it's anything else, so basically if it's sweet, just don't eat it, just make it simple. You do not need to be reading in food labels and just ignore all that. If it's sweet to you, if you taste something sweet, do not eat it for those 14 days. And I'm not gonna lie, everyone, it is not easy, <laughs> it is hard. It is hard. You will go through withdrawal symptoms. So the more addicted you are, the more you will experience withdrawal symptoms. I'm just being honest. Um, so just prepare yourself. Prepare your family members and friends. I am going to be cranky these two weeks. I might have headaches. You might feel really tired and run down because, again, your body is detoxing from sugar. I had a patient once, she was like, I was about to call urgent care. She's like, I was like, I thought something was really wrong with me. And then I realized, wow, I'm on my sugar challenge. Um, so for some people, it is really bad, but just hang in there. Go have your, you know, fruit, just hang in there. Give yourself a pep talk. You can do it because once you get over that hump, for some people, it's a week. Some people, it could be a couple of days. Some people, it might be longer depending on your, um, you know, how quote unquote addicted you are to the sugar. Once you get over that hump, you will feel better. Trust me, you will feel better. For many people, this is a game changer. Right? I had a patient who was actually telling me, he was like, he was saying that every time he would go to the dentist, he just would have so much plaque buildup. He would always have to get a deep cleaning. And it would be really painful and so on and so forth. So he's like, he did the sugar challenge. And he's like, I went back to my dentist and my dentist was like, what did you do? Your teeth are like amazing. You know, he, it was like the quickest cleaning. So even like this affects our dental health. Um, so this is really a game changer. Um, and then after the 14 days, if you want to add the sugar back in, go ahead. You might actually realize when you add sugar back in, you might have another headache because uh, your body is just not used to that. Um, so this is really a, a very powerful thing. I really encourage people to do it, uh, nor, not forcing anyone, but you know, but do it with positive vibes. Don't do it begrudgingly, right? Because if you're like, oh, I have to do it, yeah, it it's not going to work. I'm just being honest. You know, you got to go into this positive. It's going to be good for me. Look at all the other things I can have. I'm going to be enjoying really, you know, the flavors in food for what they are. All right, I lost my cursor. Okay. Now, so those are all the carbs. So now hopefully we all are feeling good about carbs. Hopefully I've dispelled any uh, misconceptions. So let's get into proteins. So this is the building block of the body, our muscle, our hair, our skin, our nails, we're all made up of protein. So we're like a walking protein. And protein can help us to repair body cells and tissues. And this actually helps with satiation. So this can actually help to keep us full because carbohydrates break down within an hour or two. And some of the more simple carbohydrates break down even quicker. But the proteins take about three to four hours to break down. So this takes the body some time. And this can actually help regulate our sugars. And I keep talking about sugars. And I know some of you are thinking, why are you talking about sugars? I'm not diabetic. But this is a concern for all of us because many of our population have higher than normal sugars. Maybe not diabetic realm, but certainly pre-diabetic realm. So this is something that we really have to be aware of. Um, so proteins, they break down into amino acids. This is, you know, what DNA is basically made up of. So our goal, everyone, is to aim for roughly about 15 to 25 grams of protein per meal. We are getting more than sufficient enough protein. We are getting a lot of protein, to be honest, as a population. So we got to kind of reel this in. 
So about 15 to 25 grams of protein, give or take. So just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like, one serving is equal to about seven, eight grams of protein. So one ounce of meat. So if you, take a, if you think about a deck of cards, one third of that is an ounce of meat. So that's about seven grams of protein. One egg or two egg whites is seven grams of protein. Half A quarter a cup of cottage cheese, seven grams of protein. Half a cup of beans, lentils, or soy, about seven grams of, of protein. Um, even peanut or other nut butters, about a tablespoon roughly, is about seven grams of protein. Those are a little bit high in fat, so I wouldn't rely on those um, as, as, as protein sources. Um, also, that should have been included here, but it's not, um, is cheese. Cheese is considered protein. So like one ounce of cheese, or like a string cheese, or like a slice of cheese, is considered protein, but just keep in mind it's it's high in fat and it's high in sodium. So again, I wouldn't be relying on cheese as my main source of protein, if that makes sense. <coughs> All right, so as we get older, this is actually a very important nutrient that we do need to focus on, that we're getting enough. And just to kind of give you an idea of like how much maybe we should be aiming for, so uh, I'll give you an equation. So you take your weight, um, for those of us in the States, divide that by 2.2 um, to get kilograms. So we got to get kilograms. So whatever your, your weight is in kilograms, you multiply that times 0.8. So your weight in kilograms times 0.8, that is how much protein your body roughly needs. And as we get older, we get into like the 60s and so forth, then that bumps up to about one gram of protein per kilogram. So older people do need a little bit more protein because as we age, we do lose muscle mass. And this is why our metabolism actually slows down is because we're not getting in sufficient protein. So we want to be aware of protein. We want to pick good quality protein. So ideally is plant-based. So beans, lentils, unprocessed soy. So that would be things like edamame, tofu, tempeh, which is um, fermented soy. So these are preferred. And we hear a lot about plant-based lifestyle, but I'm going to be honest, you guys, because again, for me, the ideal diet is the prophetic diet. It, I always come back to that. And our prophet Sassam, he did eat meat. He didn't eat a lot of meat because of course it wasn't available, but he did eat meat. So I wouldn't veer away from meat. Again, I'm very hesitant to ever tell people not to eat things that our prophet Sassam ate. So he did have meat, but think of the quality of the meat at that time. Think of the amount, think of the frequency. It wasn't that frequent. So I really would not recommend to completely be totally vegan you know, incorporate that meat, so on and so forth, you know, but again, look at the quality of the meat, you know, organic, grass fed, massaged, whatever, you know, really good quality meat, ideally. Um, so, but plant based, so we don't have to eat meat all the time every day. And I think a lot of us grew up that way. I know I certainly did. I'm like, where's the meat? It's like I didn't eat, right? If I didn't have meat, but no, you guys, as long as we're having some sort of protein. And remember, our ancestors did eat mostly you know, plant-based proteins with that meat occasionally, right? So um, seafood is fine as well, but be particular in how you are preparing the feet seafood, right? If you're having, you know, deep fried fish all the time, that's defeating the purpose. And with seafood, we want to have a variety because certain seafood, or actually all seafood, to be honest, is has contaminants in it because of our waters, unfortunately. If you are going to be buying seafood, ideally, you know, wild caught is always best, you know, from the Atlantic regions would be actually ideal. Um, but have variety of fish. Don't just keep eating every day I'm having tuna because you're just this there's, there's mercury in tuna. Right. There's PCBs and salmon. So you want to have a variety and the benefits of fish outweigh the harm. So don't stress out too much about the contaminants as long as you're having variety. Um, eggs, um, in particular, egg whites would be ideal versus the whole egg, especially for those of you that have high cholesterol. Maybe try to limit the egg yolks to like maybe, um, you know, two or three egg yolks per, per week. Um, again, if you have high cholesterol, uh, white meat of poultry like chicken, a turkey. Um, cottage cheese, but just keep in mind cottage cheese is, is high in sodium, low fat cheeses. So all of these, you know, would be a little bit better um, than some of the other proteins. Now we want to limit and avoid these type of proteins. So the high fat cheeses, red meat, beef, lamb, you know, goat. And 
ideally, we want to try to limit it, ideally, to maybe once or twice a month. I know, you guys, I know, baby steps, baby steps. Um, maybe even limiting it to once a week, you know, that's fine, too. Um, because red meat is very high in saturated fats, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And it is very inflammatory. Right? I cannot tell you how many patients I've had who told me I uh, cut out red meat and they're like, oh, my gosh, my joints feel amazing. So it is very inflammatory. Um, and ideally, we should try to get the grass fed red meats because we see a difference between grain fed and grass fed. The grain fed are more high in the omega sixes, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Um, whereas the, the grass fed are more higher in the omega threes, which are more preferable. But even then, you know, even if you're cutting down the red meat, don't say, okay, I'm having less red meat. Let me have lots of chicken because any meat in high amounts is inflammatory. So we just kind of want to keep it, just keep it to like a three ounce amount, which is about the size of a deck of cards, right? Small amount. So this is the other quarter of our plate is actually the proteins. And we want to avoid those processed meats. So like the beef sausage, the hot dogs, the deli cuts. Basically, if you don't know what animal part it came from, do not eat it. Because the problem is, and we see these in the dietary guidelines actually, is that high consumption of these processed meats actually increases risk of colon cancer and other cancers. So we really need to kind of avoid these stuff, you know, the halal pepperoni and this and that. I know that's fun once in a while, having it on our pizza, you know, so, you know, once in a while, fine, but it should not be like a regular thing. Um, maybe you can get some of those cold cuts and those you see those halal cold cuts where they're like cutting them behind the counter, they're slicing them. That's okay. But it's like some of these are packaged um, that we would want to avoid. All right, so those were the proteins. So we're, we, every meal, we want to have some sort of a carbohydrate. Every meal, we want to have some sort of a good quality protein. And every meal, we want to have a little bit of a fat. So fats help us feel full or satiated. These take five to six hours to break down. So they're really taking their time in the body. And fats are very important because they help us absorb um, the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. And right now, again, with immunity, we're really huge right now on vitamins A and D. Very, very important vitamins, especially D. Many of us are not... Uh, many of us are actually very low in vitamin D, and that can manifest in different ways in the body. You might feel it in your, you know, joints, in your bones, um, mood, right? You might feel more down. We actually see correlation there. Um, so really, we got to make sure we're getting sufficient vitamin D. And there's a lot of talk about raising um, the recommended amounts um, as we see how important this this is. And I just saw some research the other day about COVID and vitamin D, how people that are actually deficient in vitamin D might have more uh, severe symptoms, interestingly enough. Now, this doesn't mean we should go overboard either, guys. So don't be like, okay, I'm just going to go take like, mega doses of vitamin D because all of these fat-soluble vitamins, if they're toxic in high amounts. All of them have upper limits. So we never want to go over the upper limits with anything. So we always want to keep it a balance, right? This is our prophetic way, keep things balanced. Um, Healthy fats might actually lower our risk of heart disease. So for those of you that have high cholesterol issues, getting in some of those healthy fats can actually help bring down some of that bad LDL cholesterol. Now, the thing with fats that we have to remember, remember everyone, is they're very calorically dense. They are very high in calories. So we got to be moderate. So our recommendation is just generally aim for about 40 to 60 grams of total fat per day. Total. That's the good, bad, and the ugly. And saturated fat, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, we do need some saturated fat, but very small amount, roughly 10 to 15 grams. So more on the lower end of the spectrum. So of those 40 to 60 grams, about 10 to 15 grams coming from that saturated fat. It's tough. I'm not going to lie. Fat is everywhere in high amounts. Um, for example, like movie popcorn, again, pre-COVID life, right? Uh, but movie popcorn 60 grams of fat in just one popcorn box. So it really adds up. So this is where we got to really look at the quality of the fats. All right. We got to substitute. So just to kind of give you guys an idea of what this looks like visually. All right. So one serving of fat is about 45 calories, which is about five grams of fat. All right. So one teaspoon of oil has five grams of fat. Right, two tablespoons of avocado. So 
I'm in California. We're avocado people here, right? So for many of us, it's easy. We are eating avocados, you know, very frequently in large quantities. Even an avocado, it's, it's healthy fat, it's good fat, but it's a lot of fat. So we want to kind of keep it to, to small amounts. I'm not saying this is all you eat. So don't be like, oh my gosh, only one eighth of an avocado. That's depressing. I'm not saying that. I'm just kind of giving you a, just an idea of kind of roughly what it looks like. Um, 10 peanuts are five grams of fat. Six almonds are five grams of fat. Six cashews, five grams of fat. Four walnut halves, five grams of fat. It's very easy to eat a lot, right? If you get one of those Costco size, you know, mixed nuts and you're eating those as you're watching TV, that's a lot of calories, very easily consumed. So we want to be moderate. And I actually do recommend that we should be getting a handful, okay, not a canful, a handful of nuts per day. Really amazing for cognitive health and for heart health, um, walnuts, almonds, uh, peanuts, uh, Brazil nuts. So you can find get Brazil nuts, one Brazil nut has as much selenium as we need for a day. And a selenium is very important for thyroid health. Um, so that's really nice, you know, try to have one Brazil nut. Um, so, you know, try to aim for a handful of nuts. And, um, you know, again, I keep thinking, I'm gonna be doing lots of classes in Shala this coming year. I really wanna do one on power foods. And this is one of the power foods, definitely, um, are nuts. So let's talk about the fats. So what we are trying to do, you guys, is we're trying to pick better quality fats, all right? So you're substituting the types of fat you're using. So the preferred fats are actually the monounsaturated fats and the omega-3s. So monounsaturated fats, these can actually help develop and maintain cells. They can actually help lower LDL, the bad cholesterol, right? Research is looking at whether it can help lower overall total cholesterol as well. It can maybe help boost good HDL cholesterol. So a lot of benefits to monounsaturated fats. Where do we find these fats? almonds, peanuts, and their accompanying nut butters. If you're going to get nut butters, which I'm all about, um, make sure it's natural. So when you read the ingredients, the only things you should be seeing is peanut and maybe salt, almonds or maybe salt. Like that's it. Just very basic. You know, so some of these processed peanut butters that we see in the marketplace, they have lots of added fats and sugars that we do not need. So we want them natural. Yes, there's going to be oil on top. Don't freak out. Um, what I personally do is whenever I buy these nut butters as I store them upside down. So I just turn the bottle upside down and the fat kind of dissipates. It's the natural fats coming from, from the nut. So it's fine. And then when I get ready to open it, you know, a lot of it's dissipated in and then you got to stir, make sure it gets all the way to the bottom. And then you got to refrigerate it because fat, goes bad. Fat can go rancid. So, and the integrity of the fat changes as it gets older. So keep it in, in the fridge. Um, avocado and its oil. So that's my preferred oil actually is avocado oil and olive oil. Um, olive oil, it burns, at, uh, it burns pretty quick. So that's not, you know, especially the extra virgin olive oil, it's not something you would be cooking with, but you would use extra virgin olive oil in like maybe your salad dressing, you know, maybe you're cooking at low heat. Um, so avocado and its oil, olives and its oil, and especially the extra virgin olive oil. So many benefits of the extra virgin olive oil, you guys. It's like a natural aspirin in the body. But we got to make sure we're picking good quality extra virgin olive oil, you know, so that Palestinian good hardcore olive oil, you know, that's really honestly one of the best ones. That's like the original oil, if you think about it. That's what civilization really used to use, right? Um, so good quality olive oil. You do not have to be eating, drinking teaspoons of it. My mom was, uh, my mom got some WhatsApp forward the other day and she was telling me, she's like, yeah, um, it was saying I should drink olive oil. I'm like, no, 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 you add it to, you add it to foods. You eat it with foods. Don't just drink it separate, everyone. Because remember, fats, even though they're beneficial, do have those extra calories. So we got to kind of keep it in consideration. So avocado and olive oil would be the better oils to cook with. The canola oil, technically canola oil is a monounsaturated fat. Technically it's okay. Right. And I know there's a lot of weird stuff that we see online. It's really processed. You know, Canada uses it, I don't know, for petroleum. There's a lot of weird stuff online. Um, but we don't really see that in, in the research per se. But if you're kind of hesitant about it, you don't like all that stuff, then then don't use it. It's okay. You don't use it. But it's okay as of, as of now. And I know for myself personally, if I'm eating, you know, making something in larger quantities, a lot of times I will maybe just use canola. 
Um, but the preference is honestly the avocado and, and, and the olive oil. And again, olive oil, really good quality olive oil. Um, and I never realized the difference until I traveled. And I'm like, wow, there really is a difference between really good quality olive oil. So invest in that um, and use it sparingly. The other preferred fat is omega-3s. So our body, again, there's certain nutrients our body is not able to um, make. So it's relying on us to consume it. And one of them is the omega-3s. And these are essential fats to build brain cells and for heart health. Very important, especially for pregnant women earlier on in the pregnancy, because this actually helps with the baby's brain formation. It doesn't make the baby smarter, but it just makes make sure the brain is formed um, properly. Um, a lot of research looking at the omega-3s, whether they can actually help lower inflammation. This is anti-inflammatory. Um, so that's really important. Research is looking at, you know, risk of Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and other cognitive um, diseases later on. Omega-3s can actually help decrease triglycerides. Triglycerides is the fat in the blood, right? So actually we can get lots, lots of fat just floating around in our blood that can make our blood really sticky. So that's what triglyceride is. Um, so this can actually help to lower triglyceride. So the best sources of omega-3s are EPA and DHA. And this we actually find in marine life. So like algae and plankton, which we don't see in the stores yet, but I am predicting one day soon, we're going to see algae, guacamole. Um, but until that day, um, you know, we find it in fatty fish. So that would be fish like salmon mackerel, herring, albacore, tuna, trout, sardines. These are the omega-3 rich fish. All fish do have omega-3s, but these ones are ones that are a little bit higher in the omega-3 value. So the American Heart Association recommends about two servings a week, which is about, you know, three and a half ounces, about like two, three decks of carbs just, uh, per week. Um, of, of fish in general. And again, have variety. Don't just have salmon every day. Have variety because remember, all of these still have contaminants. Um, can I just do fish oil? Yes, you can um, if you want. Um, just check with your doctor, especially some of you that might be, that might have hyper, hyper, hypertension, some of you might be on blood thinners. They may actually not recommend um, omega-3s because they do kind of thin the blood. So just talk, check with your doctor if you're on any medications or have any conditions. Um, if you are going to be doing fish oil, um, you know, aim for 2000 milligrams or less um, of, of the fish oil and look at the composition. You want it to be more EPA and DHA based. So the really good quality um, fish oil are going to be a little bit more expensive because they have higher um, amounts of the EPA and, and DHA. Um, for those who are like, I don't like fish or I'm plant-based or whatever the situation may be. Yes, there are plant-based sources. That source is called AHA. Sorry, ALA, excuse me, um, ALA. Um, and that, the conversion rate from ALA to DHA is really slow, or EPA, it's really slow. It's not that, the percentage is very low. Um, so these are good sources, you know, um, you just want need to have a little bit more of them. So like microalgae, um, ground flax seeds and flaxseed oil. So you need to grind up the flaxseed to release the beneficial oils. So the ideal is to do it yourself. Uh, but you can buy ground flaxseed already ground up and then make sure you store it in, th in the fridge because remember, oil goes bad. So, you know, even when we're buying oil, don't buy these huge, you know, Costco, Sam's Club size oils, like three huge bottles sitting in your fridge or sorry, in your garage. That's a lot of oil. Just buy small amounts, be cognizant of the expiration date, you know, but just keep that in mind, you know. Uh, walnuts are really good sources of omega-3s. Chia seeds are excellent um, as well. Soybeans and tofu. And going back to ground flax seeds and flaxseed, really a lot of benefits. Flax seeds can actually decrease our cholesterol values. Um, and there's some really powerful research coming out about flax seeds and even tumor cell suppression. So that's really amazing. So, you know, trying to get, you know, maybe aim for like, get up to about a, a half a tablespoon, tablespoon. Um, of, of ground flax seeds a day, you know, just work your way to that amount. Um, so these are really, really powerful. So the omega-3s and the monounsaturated fats, these are the preferred sources of fat. This is what you're going to be using instead of some of these other fats. Now, we need to limit the overconsumption of omega-6s. So omega-6s are, are another fatty acid. We do need some omega-6s. But the problem is when we have too much omega-6s, this can actually drive more of these inflammatory pathways. So this does increase inflammation. 
which we're all dealing with, to be honest. So this is found in vegetable oils. So like corn oil, safflower oil, soybean, which here in the US, this is one of the most cheap, cheaply used oils and that's in like everything. Um, Grapeseed oil. I know many people cook with grapeseed oil. I'm sorry, that's fine, but it's an omega-6. So I wouldn't recommend cooking with these oils, blackcurrant seed, borage, evening primrose. All of these oils I wouldn't recommend cooking with and because they're already in our food supply, we're already getting too much omega-6s. We, we have to have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, and we're really off in that ratio. We need to actually get more omega-3s. So these are oils I wouldn't recommend cooking with or using um, on a regular basis for sure. Okay, saturated fat. So this is something that we really need to limit. And there's a lot of talk about saturated fat. I hear this, I see this all the time. And there's just, there's just so much stuff out there, you guys. And when you're reading some of the, the literature on a nutrition, keep in mind who puts it out, who funded the study, how many people were in the study, right? We can't extrapolate some of these nutrients and just put it into our population because sometimes the factors are not the same. Right, so we have to kind of keep in mind some of these things. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because of coconut oil, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment. But anyway, so saturated fat, this can actually raise blood cholesterol levels. So for those of you that have high cholesterol, this is the fat that you need to decrease. Don't eliminate it. We still need some saturated fat because our body uses saturated fat as the raw material to make cholesterol. And we need cholesterol. So we never wanna have zero cholesterol. I never wanna see zero cholesterol because then I don't know how you're surviving. Um, because we need cholesterol because it's a component of cells. It's a component of hormones. Our hormones actually have cholesterol in them. So we never want to be cholesterol free. We need some cholesterol and saturated fat is the raw material for our liver to make a cholesterol. But we don't want to have too much. And that's what our problem is these days. We're having so much saturated fat. It's everywhere. And it's found in animal products. So anything that has a mom or a dad <laughs> um, is going to have saturated fat and the tropical oils. So that would be like coconut oil, palm um, oil, palm kernel oil. So high saturated fat sources would be like whole milk, dairy, uh, milk, cheese, ice cream, butters. Okay, I'm not saying never eat this stuff. I'm not saying that, but just kind of reduce how much you're having. And this is why I precisely, I don't actually recommend whole milk because we're already getting so much fat, everyone, from so many sources. And I get this a lot from parents. My child's not gonna grow without that. I'm like, no, 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 your child doesn't need saturated fat to grow. Your child just needs good fat. Give your child an avocado. Feed your child some nuts. Cook with some olive oil. Like use other healthy fats instead of saturated fat. Because we have seen a correlation, again, between cholesterol values and overconsumption of saturated fat. We keep seeing that. So we have to keep that in mind, everyone. And also this, you know, these sources of saturated fat are also very inflammatory for the body too. Um, so red meat is high in saturated fat. That's why you want to have, you know, uh, less quantities of these. And then there we go, coconut and palm oil. So I know, I know, I know, I heard it all. Coconut oil is supposed to do all sorts of stuff. It's supposed to, you know, even help with world peace. Um, I'm just joking. Um, but coconut oil, you guys, we never had that solid research to back up all the claims. And even in countries that consume a lot of coconut oil, you have to look at their overall lifestyle. What else are they eating? What is their activity levels? What is their stress levels? That's why it's very difficult to pull an individual nutrient out and be like, here, we should eat this because that country's eating it and they're doing great. We have to look at what we're doing overall. So yes, if you are eating, you know, mostly plant-based, lot, you know, very unprocessed foods, you don't eat a lot, you know, you have a super healthy lifestyle, and then you want to eat with ghee, you want to add coconut oil, then go ahead. But the thing is, is the way we are eating now, the way our food is manufactured and produced, the way our lifestyle is, we have to keep all those things in, in mind. And we have to also remember, and this is another separate talk, is toxins toxins in our environment that we're inhaling and we're consuming, as well as these animals, right? It accumulates in our fat, actually. So when we're eating overconsumption of animal fats, I mean, we're eating some of that stuff. 
So we have to kind of keep that in mind. So again, I get it, you guys, I know, um, and I keep hearing the, oh, you know, key is so good for you. It sticks to your bones and things like that. You know, yes, uh, maybe if we ate differently, then that would be a different story. But we have to kind of keep in mind um, a current lifestyle before we pull some of these things in. So these things, again, you know, you can use them in small quantities. I'm not saying never have them, um, but just really keep it moderate. And we should avoid a trans fat, also called partially hydrogenated fats. This is a Franken fat. This is man-made. This was created, I think, in the late 1800s to basically extend the shelf life of, of foods. Um, but the problem with this is this totally backfired, totally backfired. And what it actually does is it increases our total cholesterol, our LDL bad cholesterol. It decreases our good HDL cholesterol. It's just bad. And our Food and Drug Administration, it did ban the use of trans fat, but it's a very slow transition. So it's still lurking out there. It used to be in margarines. It's shortening. Anytime you see partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated, it indicates trans fat. So just put it away. And I think Europe is, again, always way ahead of us on this stuff, type of stuff. So you Europeans don't have to worry too much about this, hopefully. Now, so those were the my, macronutrients. So all of those nutrients, everyone, we do need in sufficient quantities. All right. So fats, carbs, proteins, and water. Now we have micronutrients. So micronutrients are like vitamins and minerals. And I'm not going to get into that because that's a whole separate session on and of, its, of itself. But one micronutrient I do want to uh, flag is sodium. So sodium, we're aiming for about 2,400 milligrams per day, um, which equates out to about 600 to 700 milligrams per meal. All right. With the remainder being snacks. And just to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like, one teaspoon of salt has about 2,000 milligrams of sodium. So it's not a lot. And the problem is not when we're cooking at home. The problem is when we're buying these packaged or processed or these having these restaurant foods. We know we see, you know, uh, low sugar movements. We see low fat movements. We don't really see low sodium movements. And we really should because 90% of the American population will have high um, blood pressure at some point in our lives. It's just, it's, it's a big public health problem. So we really want to go easy um, on the sodium. So use herbs and spices to, to flavor your foods. All right. So now that we have the foundation, everyone, let's talk about some basics here. All right. So hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that kind of pieced things together. Hopefully that helped, um, you know, really, because there's a lot of random weird stuff out there and misconceptions out there. Um, so, you know, just, just keep that in, in, in mind that, you know, really we have to look at things in a very objective way. So now that we have this foundations, all right, what do we do? How should I eat? So this is the thing, you guys. Ideally, we want to space out our meals every four to six hours apart, give or take. All right. Um, snacks only if you're legitimately hungry. Okay. Legitimately, not, oh, hey, I'm watching TV. I saw this commercial and I'm hungry. Like legit hungry. I am feeling it in my body. Then you have a snack, not a whole meal. Um, diabetics, by the way, if any of you are diabetic, you have a very you know, you, you really have to make sure you're eating regularly and it has to be really um, balanced um, in terms of carbs and all of that. Um, so snacks only if you're legitimately hungry. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the earlier meals, meaning breakfast, being the larger meal. All right. So it's kind of like that saying, eat like a, you know, king or queen breakfast, uh, lunch like a, a prince or princess, you know, dinner like a pauper, right? So you're just eating less. And this is really key um, and very important because we, should, because we should also have dinner earlier on in the evening because this goes back to our ancestors. So looking at us, looking at us as, as human species, our ancestors, you know, we were really, think about our circadian rhythm, right? We humans would wake up early and sleep early, right? Because they would function off the sun. Right? This is, of course, pre-electricity. But you didn't hear about people burning the midnight oil, right? Um, being up till, you know, 2 a.m., binge watching TV shows and things like that. Like, this wasn't a common occurrence. This is not what our body is used to. And we see a difference even in the hormones that are circulating. At night, 
we see growth hormone increases. And as a result, insulin can um, decrease. And then that really is problematic because that's difficult then for our body to get the sugars used. So if we're eating late at night, our body's handling, you know, digestion a little bit differently. Right. Nighttime is, again, a time of like a detox. Even our gut is like, you know, detoxing itself. So we have to kind of keep that in, in, in mind, everyone. So that's why, you know, have dinner earlier on in the evening. Maybe whatever time your bedtime is, maybe cut your last meal two to three hours before that. Um, except for those of you that have diabetes and you follow the diabetic guidelines and don't do that. But really, you know, we should try to kind of uh follow what the circadian rhythm is. Um, and the recommendation, and we see this a lot in the research, really good research keeps coming out on this, is intermittent fasting. And there's different ways of having intermittent fasting, of doing it. Um, but the best that's actually, you know, evidence-based is the 12 to 16 hour gap between your last meal and your first meal of the next day. All right, so let's suppose you decide I'm going to cut off my food at 7 p.m. Like cut down, like close down the kitchen. Just do not eat. I mean, obviously, if you're legitimately hungry, please eat. But if you're not, then don't. So let's suppose 7 p.m. you stop eating. Then do not eat again till 7 a.m. the next day. If you're good, maybe extend it out to like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., right? So try to give your body um, a rest, truly. Um, and then eat, and then again, try to kind of cut it off earlier on. Now, if you are just keeping your eating, you know, to a certain amount of time in the day, you know, like maybe an eight hour span of time, then, then that's fine. Don't go less than four hours. I see a lot of these 20 um, hour fast, intermittent fasting. Um, that's not really recommended. So, you know, make sure, you know, if you're, you're eating, you, you keep that eight hour maybe space of the day or fast as is in our sunnah. Like there's so many benefits, just the Muslim fast. Okay. And not the modern day Muslim fast. Okay. The modern day Muslim fast is we break our fast and we have all the fried foods and all those goodies that that's not what we're talking about here. Like the really traditional fast, right. Of, you know, you're, you're, you're just keeping it simple. So twice a week, right. There is a lot of benefit truly in that. Um, so try to incorporate, you know, just regular, you know, just Muslim fasting in, in there as well. Um, and then, you know, going back again really quickly, I, I want to make a note of, of, you know, spacing out our meals um, and not having, you know, so many snacks. Because snacks, we see this a lot. We hear this a lot. Oh, eat every two hours. There really isn't good research behind that. I'm going to be honest. Because again, think of the human species. We did not fast. Sorry, excuse me. We didn't eat every two hours because we just didn't have that food availability. Like, do you, have you read that or heard that? Though it's time for a snack. Let's stop harvesting and let's eat our snack. No, right? Human beings didn't eat that much. And even in the prophetic life, like they didn't eat that much. They didn't have that much food availability. So we have to kind of keep that in consideration. Uh, make sure when we're eating, we have a carbohydrate, a protein and or a healthy fat at every meal and snack. So you want to balance it out. And again, focus on quality, variety, and watch those portion sizes. <clears throat> so here are some calorie references. So I'm not really big on people obsessing over calories. It's really counterproductive because more important is the quality of the calories. But use these as like set points. Let's suppose you're going out, you're picking up some food, you're getting your, your latte or whatever. Just keep this in mind that for meals, keep them to about 500, 600 calories, give or take give or take plus or minus just don't double it so don't be like at a thousand calorie meals but let's suppose oh hey it's sunday brunch you know my daughter made some stuffed french toast i want to eat some okay fine you know it's a once in a while thing fine you're over your calories a little bit okay fine but roughly keep it here and this is really powerful because again when we go out to eat or when we're purchasing things look at the calories it's very eye-opening sometimes those calories are really truly too much um, snacks, keep them to about 100 to 200 calories, you know, give or take. Um, so again, just keep this in mind and just, you know, this helps us to sometimes rethink some choices. Now we're really big um, in general on, on the plate method. Um, so the plate method is we want half of our 
plate to be actually the non-starchy vegetables. So all the vegetables except peas, corn, and potatoes should be about half of our plates. You know, some of the, yeah, even getting those fruits in there are fine. Um, that's all right. But roughly it should be more, you know, vegetable based. A quarter of our plate is a whole grain or our starchy vegetables. So in this case, some, I don't know, whatever this is, it's like couscous. Um, brown rice, your corn tortilla, your your beans, your lentils, whatever would go in a quarter of your plate. And the other quarter of your plate is your protein, right? So in this case, we have some fish. It can be, you know, your chicken. It can be, again, beans and lentils can also go here as well, your soy, um, your eggs. So whatever you're eating, if you dissected your plate, it doesn't look like this. I think for many of us, the answer is no, it's not, because what we're missing is those vegetables. So that's what we have to really, truly work on, right? And, and it doesn't have to be bland and boring and boiled, right? Just whatever you're eating, you know, just can I add more vegetables to this? Can I have less? Like, let me, let me decrease some of those carbs. You know, why am I having, you know, three cups of rice? Like, let me just make do with one cup, right? So trying to reconfigure our plates, Now, we see a lot of really, really powerful research actually coming out on, on the Mediterranean diet. And I don't want to call it diet because diet sometimes makes me feel like, you know, it's a crash diet or a fad diet. Think of it as a lifestyle. So in the Mediterranean region, so those countries bordering the Mediterranean, uh, southern Italy, Spain, northern Africa, Greece, they actually have very low rates of, of heart disease and stroke despite the fact that they're consuming, you know, a lot more fat than in many other countries. But the type of fat that they're consuming is actually the olive oil, the olives, like, you know, the good non-processed, you know, monounsaturated omega-3 fats. And we have to look at their overall lifestyle. They don't eat lots of processed foods, right? And their lifestyle is a lot more kickback and, and slow paced, right? So we have to also consider those things as well. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, Mediterranean, that means I have to eat falafel and hummus and let me eat, have lots of olive oil. No, it's, we have to look at the whole picture. So with the whole picture of the Mediterranean um, is actually, it's more plant-based, right? Lots of fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains, uh, legumes, um, seeds. Again, you know, it says two times a week. I would do this, honestly, I would do this daily, to be honest. Uh, seafood a couple times a week, dairy, um, poultry, eggs, and then meats and sweets, you know, really, you know, limit it once a week, avoid processed um, if possible. Um, and uh, also incorporating that activity, right? Slowing down, right? Just slow it down. And that's another thing I'm going to be talking about in, in just a moment is, is looking beyond just what we're eating. But the quality of the food and the quality of our, of our lifestyle. So out of all the diets uh, and quote unquote lifestyles, this honestly keeps coming out as one of the, 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 the better ones, um, even in terms of the gut microbiome. And this again is very, this is very prophetic as well, if, if we really think about it. Um, so this hands down really is, is one of the is, is ideal ways to, to do things. All right. So let's talk about the weight loss mindset. So those of you that are just trying to lose weight or just being healthier, I really want to emphasize this. You are not on a diet. Okay, tell that to yourself. Write that in your journal. I'm not on a diet because there's just so much negativity attached to that word, right? It means restriction, temporary, boring, vegetables. Like, let's, let's, we're not, just get over it. We're not on a diet. We are doing a lifestyle change. And the thing is, the biggest thing, this is why I always prefer, you know, weight management to be like a series, you know, like a support group, because it's our behaviors that we have to focus on. Many of you knew what I was talking about. A lot of you, this was like a, 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 just basically, you know, a refresh. But taking what we know and incorporating it to what we do, this is the biggest issue. So this is what we have to work on. And this is why that journal that I was recommending earlier on, like writing down what you're eating, what time, you know, how much is very powerful because then you start to notice things, right? So that's what we kind of have to do is look at our behavior. Why am I eating? I just had dinner. Why am I having chips? I'm stressed. Why am I eating? This, this is not going to help my stress, right? So truly weight management is a multifaceted approach. It's not only what we eat. It's not. It's also our physical activity, it's our sleep and stress management. 
Um, <laughs> does that mean I can just eat whatever I want and just exercise it off and have lots of friends and just sleep a lot? No, it doesn't work that way either. You have to balance all four of these things. Um, and also we have to remember, especially as we're maturing, um, our hormones really wreak havoc on our body. You know, especially as one enters perimenopause and menopause, estrogen levels start to drop. As estrogen levels start to drop, we see a redistribution of fat more, toward, uh, more towards like a, the abdominal region, you know? And yes, our metabolism does slow down as we get older because what's happening is that we're less active, right? We're more stressed. We're not getting enough sleep. We're losing muscle mass. The only way we can boost our metabolism, everyone truly is by trying to maintain, hold on to that muscle mass, making sure we're getting sufficient, good quality protein, making sure we're doing weight bearing exercise in there. That's not only good for our bones, it's also good for our, our, our muscle mass as well. You know, try to do some, you know, resistance training two to three times a week. Um, there's great videos online, tons of videos online that we can do. So that's very, very important. Now, hormone regulation, we just got to go with the flow. And, you know, inshallah, I hope later on to do a session on on, on hormones and, and all that. Um, but we have to remember that our hormones, our neurotransmitters are really affected by the foods that we eat. You know, especially our neurotransmitters, you know, they are made up of amino acids. If we're not getting good quality proteins in foods, it's going to affect the amino acid distribution. And that can really affect our mood and, 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 and so forth. Our gut microbiome, this is huge area. This is a huge area um, that I have a whole session on. So when we're not eating well, when we are stressed and you know, we have high inflammation levels, we're not sleeping enough, it really wreaks havoc on the, the gut microbiome and that can affect inflammation. Inflammation can also affect the gut microbiome. It's like, you know, these are both interconnected. Um, actually, all these things are interconnected. So these do play a role. So what can we do is just do our best, just try to make those good food choices, try to get those physical activity in, um, really work on our sleep and our stress management, you know, doing that self-care, you know, really evaluating, you know, uh, how we're perceiving our stress, how we're handling the stress. That's the biggest thing. You know, if we're always negative, then that's very inflammatory for the body. If we're always perceiving things as like we're panicking and oh my gosh, this is life threatening, then that's what's going to manifest inside. And that mindset makes weight management very difficult. I'm being honest, very, very difficult. Now it's okay to eat fun things because we're human beings. So it's okay. I never want people to be like, I'm never eating that. That always makes me very nervous. And people are like, I'm never eating sweets. I'm going to be sweet free. I'm never having dessert. Like just don't set yourself up. It's okay to eat fun things that you like, but do you need it? And sometimes you're like, yes, I do. Yes, today I need this. So then that's fine. If you need it, if you really feel like you need it, then it's okay. Eat it slowly. Savor it. Don't feel guilty. Don't be like, I'm bad. You're not bad. You're a human being and you felt like you needed it. So it's okay. And try to keep these fun foods to just one item per day. And this is if needed. So let's suppose you're like, you know what? I really do, you know, my daughter made a brownies. My friend dropped off some cupcakes. I really would like to have some. Okay, have it. Eat it slowly. Savor it. Try to limit it to 100 to 200 calories. Be a calorie snob. Don't just eat whatever chocolate. Eat high quality chocolate. Eat some Swiss chocolate or whatever. Like be really particular about some of these fun foods. And then that's it. Don't have anything else until the next day. So if someone comes by later, you know, you get some other dessert in the mail or whatever, then save it for the next day. Just try to limit it to one thing. And that helps to actually get the edge off. You can even factor it in as part of your day to day that, you know what, four o'clock, I always feel like having something, I'm just going to have a hundred, 200 calories of a really nice cookie and I'm going to enjoy it. And then I'm going to focus on what I'm having the rest of the day. That's the key. What are you mostly eating? What are you mostly doing? That's the key. Now, one thing I would highly recommend, though, is evaluate if it's a high trigger food. We have some foods, let's be honest, that we don't just eat one of, right? So if it's a food that you're like, I don't just eat one, I eat a lot, I, I can't stop at 200 calories, I'm going to eat 2000, then don't have it. Avoid it. Seriously, don't bring it into the house. Don't have it in front of you. Seriously, because we have to also realize, you know, how much willpower that we can have. So just don't bring that stuff in. 
Um, it's okay to have it you know, later on when we've kind of retrained, because this is the thing, you guys, is when we start to eat better, as we start to really change up the way we're eating, you will find that you won't even want some of those other foods anymore. They just won't set well, that you just won't feel good. But it takes time for that to occur. So here are some evidence-based strategies for weight loss. Again, this is, you know, I did this um, last year, so this is a whole separate thing, but move more, especially just natural physical activity. Like, don't just get a chunk of, I'm going to exercise for 30 minutes, I'm going to sit the rest of the day. That's not helpful. Keep moving. Every hour, move one to two minutes. If you're stuck in front of your computer, it's, it's you know, you're, so many people are working from home. Like, get up every hour, stretch, go do some push-ups against the wall. Um, you know, move for a couple of minutes and then get back to your work. Um, manage your stress. This is this is a whole separate session, and inshallah, I hope we have a series um, through Rahma on just stress management and stress perception. You know, this includes social connection, which I know right now we're not getting that face to face. But this is where we have to just try even harder. You know, get that Zoom connection, that you know FaceTime connection, or whatever. When it's safer, you know, meeting people outside. You know, we'll and inshallah, this 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 pandemic ends soon. But this is really a huge thing that we have to really try to focus on is working on our stress levels. And that is the perception of your stress, right? How are you perceiving it? Are you perceiving it as a threat or are you perceiving it as a challenge? That's the key. Get enough quality sleep. And I know that's hard. It's not easy, especially for stressed. But really, it's something that we got to work on, you know, that, that seven to nine hours. And again, this isn't our uh, prophetic lifestyle of just like trying to sleep early, right? The recommendation is to eat, to sleep relatively soon after Isha, right? Um, and then get up early. Um, so try to get work on the sleep, you know, gut health. That's, again, um, you know, really connected to what we're eating and our stress and um uh, physical activity, eat less processed, wholesome foods, preferably more plant-based foods, watch your portions. Um, so get a nine inch plate and just cordon it off. Like I told you, half the plate, non-starchy vegetables, one fourth of a plate, good quality protein, other quarter of a plate, my good quality, you know, carbohydrate, my fruit on the side, right? My healthy fat that I've maybe cooked with, or I'm just like adding. Um, watch your, sorry, sorry, I mentioned that, watch your portions. Don't drink your calories. Honestly, you guys cut out all the caloric dense beverages, you know, the sodas, the juices, the smoothies, all of that stuff, you know, really try to cut it off. Keep it simple. Water, um, you know, the, the milks or the, uh, plant-based milks, tea, coffee's fine as well, but make sure you're, watch what you're putting in the coffee. So really watch the calories, um, in from the drinks, plan your meals, um, very powerful because a lot of times we're just scrounging and that's what messes us up. And then keep track of what you're eating and drinking. Research shows that when we keep track of what we're eating and drinking, we lose double the weight than those that don't. Now, I'm going to end on this subject of mindfulness. This is, a, this is like a billion dollar industry now, right? Being more mindful. There's like so many apps and uh, podcasts on being more mindful. So being mindful in terms of our hunger. So we have to remember everyone, it takes 20 minutes, 20 minutes for our stomach to send the message to our brain that we've had enough to eat. So our stomach will stretch out, there's receptors in the stomach and the small intestine, um, you know, little satiation receptors, and they'll tell, they'll send messages to the brain that, hey, we are good. Stop it. We're not hungry anymore. But it takes 20 minutes for that to kick in. So that's why everyone slow it down when you eat, you know, drink your water and then really think, do I really need another helping? Let me wait 20 minutes and see how I feel, right? So our stomach tells the brain, it's not the other way around. So assessing hunger, how do you know you're really hungry? And it's, it's interesting that we have to talk about this because a lot of people actually don't know anymore because we're so programmed like in our regular meals, like I gotta eat every three hours and everything's programmed and we're not like listening to our body, right? Because we have a schedule. So physical hunger, stomach is growling, haven't eaten four to six hours, body feels weak or shaky. We have a decreased energy level, brain fog, irritability. That's when you eat. Okay, when you start to feel that way, not when you're like hangry, right? Hungry, angry, where you're like, I'm ravenous, I'll eat anything right now. Then you waited too long and then it gets really ugly. So don't wait too long. 
when you start to feel this way, and for everyone, it's different. I know for me personally, I actually get a headache, like a dull headache. So when your body's telling you, you know, maybe you should start to think about eating, then you should start to think about eating and eat and see what the window is from when I start to feel hungry to when I'm hangry, because it's a very thin window. If we wait too long, we all have experienced this. We eat way too much. And then that 20 minute like segment gets thrown to the side because we're so hungry. Emotional hunger is, it doesn't mean you're emotional, but it just means it's emotion based, right? You're anxious, depressed, bored, tired, happy, angry, seeing or smelling food, watching TV, smelling food. Like, you know, that happens a lot too for people. That's not real hunger. So for those things, do other things, right? Find other ways to manage that emotion based hunger, right? Um, if you're stressed, do not take it out through food, which many people do. It's not going to solve the problem, right? It's just going to make us feel worse. So we have to find other ways, other coping mechanisms. So on a scale of one to 10, one is starving. So this is where, I don't know, even lettuce looks good to us. We're so starving. Um, and 10 is stuffed. You know, for us Americans, you know, Thanksgiving, we overdid it, right? Um, so on a scale of one to 10, we should start eating at level three where you're like, yeah, I'm kind of getting hungry. Um, I should start to think about eating, you know, and you stop eating at level seven when you can get a couple of more bites in, but you prefer not to. And this is, again, this is our prophetic way of eating, right? We've all heard that, you know, one third water, one third food, one third air, right? So this is th this right here. So just never eat till you're you're full this is even you know we in the prophet Sam's life we he never ate till he was full so this is something that we really have to take into consideration so a little nice summary everyone just to kind of round things off on things we can do so cut out those sugary drinks honestly everyone even the 100 percent juice it's like you can get the benefits from the fruit itself uh, decrease to eliminate the dessert intake, baby steps. Uh, decrease to eliminate those snacky carbs, the chips, the crackers. I don't care if it's quinoa, black bean chips. It's still chips. I don't care if it's organic. Organic doesn't mean it's healthier. And we'll talk about that in the label reading class I'm going to do a little bit later on. Um, so just because it's organic doesn't automatically give you, you know, give us the seal that this is amazing and good food. It just means it was uh, grown without all those pesticides and chemicals. Um, decrease to eliminate the enriched flour products like white bread, white rice, white pasta, um, less processed foods. So when you look at the ingredients, less ingredients, the better. Have more of a plant slant. Maybe you decide I'm only going to eat one meat meal a day, right? Maybe I'm going to have lunch as my meat meal um, or whatever you want to do. Um, more day-to-day -day physical movement. So just get your exercise in. Ideally, we want 150 minutes of exercise per day, but even more important is just that day-to-day -day movement. You know, try to get those 10,000 steps if, if possible. Um, stress management and self-care. If there's one thing I could highlight out of this entire slide, it would be this. Because this right now, currently, because of COVID, because of everything going on, this is what's causing that, you know, quarantine 15, that, you know, COVID-19 pounds. Um, this is, is, is the problem for a lot of people. So, and this and sleep. So stress and sleep, really, we need to work on. And then, you know, everyone just, if you're feeling, you know, just really down and just disheartened, don't. You know, we're really blessed in so many different ways. So, you know, flip it. What are you grateful for? You know, try to have positive vibes, you know, just have a fake smile. <laughs> After a while, it becomes a real smile, right? Because when we are full of negativity and if we view the world with, through a negative lens and if everything just seems hard, I don't like white rice. I'm sorry, I don't like brown rice. I hate quinoa. I don't like salmon and everything's just negative. I don't want exercise. And guess what, guys? It's not going to work. So we have to do our best. Right, so it really truly, as I mentioned earlier, starts from the inside out. So changing our mindset, our thoughts control our emotions, which control our behavior. All right, whoops, so there we are. We are done everyone. Hopefully uh, this was helpful. Hopefully, you know, maybe you learned something new. Hopefully this helped to solidify some of the information that you already know. My goal actually for this talk was, talk was for more like a pep talk because I know this again has been a challenging year, but we're starting afresh. Inshallah, it's going to be a better year. And inshallah, you know, we 
it's just remember that we're a community. We're all trying to just do our best. And that's all what we're asking for. So with that said, let me see if we have questions here. Thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, okay, so someone mentioned, can you share an example of what you put in the journal or food diary? So Maham, great question. So basically just write down what time you ate what you ate and what could also be helpful is this and especially if we're really busy during the day is just take pictures of what you're eating and then like go back at the end of the day and again you're not judging yourself please don't judge yourself i can't believe i ate that it's horrible no no no. oh i ate a little bit too much cake no problem next time i have a little bit less so whatever you're doing like audit yourself you know compare what you're eating to the plate method you know how often are you eating ask yourself do you really need to eat that um, so maybe have a column, time you ate, what you ate, amount you ate, how you felt before you ate, how you felt after you ate, right? And then maybe a column like, you know, lessons. Um, because this is one of the most powerful tools. This is actually how I work as a dietitian. You know, whenever people tell me, I want to lose weight, I want to get healthier. My question to them first is send me a food diary. I want to see what you're doing. And very few people do it <laughs> because it's very hard sometimes to face what we're actually doing, right? We feel ashamed, we feel bad. And, you know, a lot of times people don't want, people don't want me to know. And I'm like, believe me, I've seen it all. So nothing phases me at this point. Um, but yeah, so just kind of keep track. And it doesn't have to be every day. You can maybe just pick a couple times a week, maybe twice, two weekdays and one weekend day. And, and just kind of see, um, highlight some things that you feel like you, you want to change. Um, so my email address, I think, um, was put below. And yeah, the someone asked a question about, yes, if when we consume a lot of artificial sweeteners, it really affects our taste buds. I had a patient once, I was looking at her food record, and she had put down that she had strawberries, and then she added sugar to her strawberries. And I was like, you add sugar to your strawberries? She's like, yeah, I don't feel like fruit's sweet enough. And it's because she would literally be consuming packets upon packets of artificial sweeteners every day. So it was really messing with her, her taste buds. So that's the thing, you guys, is we want to kind of go back to the foundations. When we eliminate the sugar, we start to appreciate the true taste of, of, of foods. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, Annie mentioned about um, white breads and grains. A lot of times have added sugar, or unhealthy sugar, if, if you're trying to do the sugar challenge. But, you know, again, it, it, sometimes it can get a little bit complicated. So ideally, you know, what I'm just going to say is if it tastes sweet, just don't have it for the sugar challenge. But yeah, a lot of these um, breads have a lot of sugar. So ideally, we want to have less than five grams, five, six grams of sugar. Um, the new labels, and I am going to be doing a label reading class. So just, you know, stay tuned. You guys will give you dates on that. In the label reading class, I will show you there is, um, uh, they have a, a, a column where it says added sugars. You want that to be zero, right? And then for those that have hypothyroidism, would higher selenium make any difference? Um, that's something to talk to your doctor about um, with these individual cases. Um, but selenium is just good for overall thyroid support. What you would get in a Brazil nut should be should be decent. Um, but yeah, talk to your doctor about that. Um, is frozen vegetables good? Yes, all vegetables are good. I don't care how we eat them. And the thing with frozen vegetables, remember, they, they kind of flash frozen. So they do retain a lot of those nutrients. Um, and do do you've been intermittent fasting every day for the last two weeks yeah that's no that's good that's fine that's excellent so you can be you know intermittent fasting and um are you i kind of want to know what you mean by intermittent fasting because there's different definitions so i should if you want to write that in the chat box like how you're doing the intermittent fasting but yeah i would actually personally suggest you know trying if we could, I know it's not easy, but maybe sometimes doing like the Muslim fast, like proper Muslim fast, you know, um, and maybe doing that once a week or twice a week. And then the other days, maybe a couple of those days, do the intermittent fasting where you're maybe doing like the 12 hour gap, like, you know, maybe eight or sorry, seven, eight p.m. to seven, eight a.m. Um, Okay, so great question, Asia. Um, we see in the Hadith, we see a recommendation of filling one third of your stomach with food, one third with water, and leave one third for air. Is there a way to measurement? That's so. That's an excellent question. Um, so the stomach capacity is actually about this. It can stretch out to about the size of a football. Um, so. I don't know how we would measure that in terms of like cups, because you have to also remember, and we, and we noticed this in Ramadan, right? In Ramadan, how many of you notice that when you start 
to, you know, eat again regularly that like we don't eat as much because our stomach has kind of shrunken down, right? So what I would honestly recommend for this just to kind of gauge um, is that just stop eating, you know, a couple bites short from, you know, being full. Because remember, in 20 minutes, it's really going to kick in that, that we're full. And that should roughly be about that amount. All right. So you eat from 12 to 8. Yeah, so that's that's fine. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so that's, if you do that twice a week, if you do that every day, that, that should be fine. Yeah. Any other questions? Are we good? Fadwa, are you there? I don't know if Fadwa is there. I'm there. Oh, here you are. You are <laughs> so friend. Much, we really appreciate your expertise in this area. It's one of the areas, mashallah, one of the areas that you shine in. And um, we're so pleased uh, to have you available for these sessions. And like he mentioned, um, she would like to do the next session on food labeling. So please, if you haven't added yourself to our mailing list, um, you can head over to our website, um, therahmafoundation.org and add yourself um, on the contact list so that you are mailing, uh, you add yourself to our mailing list so that you'll get all our emails. Also, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, um, where we also keep people updated. Uh, this session was recorded and it will be uploaded uh, to our YouTube page soon. And then it will also be linked um, onto our website uh, in a couple of days. As soon as we get that update, we'll let you guys know. Um, and again, thank you so much to Ruhi. If you'd like to support the Rahma Foundation, you can head over to our website and um, offer a donation. You can start the year off right, right? We're going to start healthier and more generous, inshallah. We thank you all for your attendance and inshallah, you all have a very good year, um, healthy and protected from any harm, inshallah. So jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>